It is a true honor to welcome Pulitzer Prize winning historian David Blight to Harrisburg. Professor Blight is the Sterling Professor of History and the director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University. He is the author or editor of a dozen books and annotated editions of Douglas's first two autobiographies. He's worked on Douglas much of his professional life, and he's been awarded the Bancroft Prize, the Abraham Lincoln Prize, the Frederick Douglass Prize, and yes, the Pulitzer Prize. And in his new award-winning biography, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, he uh, has not only won awards, but he was named uh, one of the best books of the year by the New York Times Book Review, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, San Francisco Chronicle, and Time. And I don't need to tell you all that because ever since it came out, it's been one of our very best sellers here at the bookstore. People are craving a wonderful biography such as Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. In his biography, Blight has drawn on new information held in a private collection that few other historians have ever consulted, as well as recently discovered issues of Douglas's newspapers. It has been called the definitive biography of Frederick Douglass, and it is a powerful portrait of one of the most important American voices of the 19th century. So without further ado, would you please join me in giving a warm Harrisburg welcome to Professor David Blight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, he's a tough act to follow. Wow. Uh, I thought, like, the circus train was going to come in next or something. <laughs> Man, just another author talking about a book. I'm sorry you don't all have seats. Uh, I'd have brought long pillows. If, no, I wouldn't have. I couldn't have carried them. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, what an amazing bookstore this is. I'm sorry this is my first time. I'm not sorry it's my first time here, but I'm sorry I haven't been here before. I have good friends here in Harrisburg who have been telling me about this store. So it's high time, to say the least. Uh, I can't believe this. You're sitting in <laughs> aisles and... Uh, oh, my God. I have to confess what I just confessed to the mayor and his wife. Um, I've done, I don't know, uh, way over 100 book talks in the past 16 months about this. But give me a great bookstore, a public library, a historical society, a museum, any day, uh, than another history department. <laughs> um, you know, we're all too busy in the academy. Uh, I went to Stanford and like, you know, 30 people showed up. And half of them were my friend Richard White's graduate students, you know. <laughs> but, I, but I'd rather go where real people read books. Um, not that academics aren't real people, at least most of them. <laughs> now, okay, uh, this book would not exist without that private collection that, that you mentioned. So let me say a word about that. Um, I had no intention of doing a new biography of Douglas. I did my first book on Douglas. It was my dissertation <laughs> some decades ago. It was a kind of a narrow study of uh, the meaning of the Civil War in Douglas's life. I edited editions of his first two autobiographies. I wrote essays on Douglas. Uh, I uh, put out a new edition of The Columbian Order, that magical book that uh, Fred Bailey f uh, discovered when he was about 11 and 12 years old. Uh, Douglas was some piece or part of every other book I've ever written, but I had him out of my life, finally gone. Until about 12 and a half years ago, I went to Savannah, Georgia. Uh, you may think of all places. Um, to give a talk to middle and high school teachers about Douglas's narrative, the first autobiography, which I've done many times, and I love doing it. I love being with teachers, particularly about that text. And as I arrived, my host was the Georgia Historical Society, and its chief historian, Stan Deaton, said, as a local gentleman here in town who's a collector, and I know some of you are collectors, 
well, <laughs> you're a collector, my God. Um, uh, that day, uh, and they said, he'd like to go to lunch with you and talk. And apparently I said something rather stupid, like, I guess so. Uh, you know, I don't know what I was thinking. But that day I met the most remarkable man, Walter Evans, uh, who took me over to his house, uh, a very large uh, four-story brownstone in Savannah. If you know Savannah, it's on Jones Street, about two blocks off Forsyth Park. Walter is an African-American retired surgeon who grew up in segregated Savannah, uh, came north for his higher education, did his BA at Howard University in Washington, uh, went to the University of Michigan Medical School, and practiced as a general surgeon and, and did very well uh, in Detroit for about 35 years. I grew up in Flint, Michigan, just up the road from Detroit. <laughs> Uh, so we had that in common. Uh, but that day, he took me over to his house, and he got out on his dining room table uh, a, a big portion of his Frederick Douglass collection, most of which he bought from one other collector. Those of you who are collectors, you know how eccentric you are. You know how these things happen between collectors by telephone calls and sometimes at auction. At any rate, that day, I did not decide I'm going to, you know, it wasn't my road to Damascus moment. There was no destiny about anything. I was scared of that collection at first. I, oh, no, please, God. Don't, I, why did I have to run into this? I don't want to, I don't want to do a new full life of Douglas. That's way too hard. It's too, too big, too long, too hard. And I took, I don't know, six, eight months to figure it out. Although my agent, once she found out about this, she said, you're doing this book. I said, no, I'm not. You're doing this book. No, I'm not. I, I don't want to. You're doing this book. And then finally, I was doing this book. Uh, because, you know, if I didn't, somebody else would. So never underestimate the motivation of competition. Um, so uh, I spent some six or so Yale spring breaks in Savannah, which is really tough duty because it's the whole middle of March, which is azalea time there. It's really a hard time to be sitting in an archive. But it's the most amazing archive I've ever worked in, uh, Linda and Walter Evans' dining room table. Uh, I, I went several other weeks uh, at various times. Uh, Linda and Walter have become dear friends, sort of my patrons. And if you have the book, you'll note that it is dedicated to them and to uh, my best friend who died while I was writing this. Without running into that collection, I, I don't do this book. Now, what's significant about the collection, and then I'll leave that be, is that the core of it, although there's many other elements to it, the core of it are nine very large Douglas family scrapbooks. Scrapbooking was a huge thing in the 19th century. To some degree, it hasn't died. Um, but we don't just do clippings anymore, do we? There's nothing to clip. Um, although I'm carrying the Washington Post and the New York Times with me today, paper, you know, I carry them everywhere. Um, but at the core of it are nine huge scrapbooks kept by Douglas's sons. He had three surviving adult sons, one surviving adult daughter, over the last 30 to 35 years of their father's life. That includes thousands of newspaper clippings, uh, which could not be otherwise accessed uh, no matter how much of this world gets digitized because there are so many of them are from obscure newspapers all over the country that obviously don't exist anymore. Also includes a lot of family documents, a lot of family letters, and two absolutely priceless treasures that are short handwritten narratives by two of the sons with titles like Growing Up in the Douglas Household. And if you're a biographer, I mean, you just, you just kill for a document like that. Uh, uh, there are two of them, one by Frederick Jr., one by Charles, two of the sons. Not only is that important just as a document, but it gave me yet more access to understanding their mother. <laughs> 
Anna Murray Douglas, who remained illiterate all of her life and has always been an enigma, difficult to see, difficult to get at, difficult to explain and understand. So, all praise to Walter and Linda Evans, um, especially in such a great bookstore as this, which includes rare books, used books, new books. Uh, and by the way, uh, Walter isn't just a collector of manuscripts. In fact, uh, his, his, his house is entirely chocked full of, of archive boxes. He knows what he's doing. He buys the <laughs> proper archive boxes. Although this stuff shouldn't be in his house. Um, and then all over the house are his rare book collection. He has a first edition of every, everything you can imagine ever written by an African American, and then some. And then his art collection is by far more valuable than all the rest of it. He's the executor of Jacob Lawrence's estate. He has uh, great works all over the house. I sat every day in the dining room. If you know African-American art at all, you perhaps have heard of the famous landscape painter named Duncanson. The, the dining room has five Duncan, Duncansons all around the wall. You walk in the front door, there's an Edmonia Lewis statue and a Romare Bearden on this wall and a, and a uh, as Walter would say, a Jake on this wall. Um, <laughs> so... He's been written up in the New York Times, Arts Page, and lots of other places. And I can almost safely say we're about 90% certain that that collection is very soon to end up at the Beinecke Library at Yale. The trouble is Walter is a hell of a businessman. Uh, and he waited till this book came out. And the original offer they gave him five or so years ago, which was really, really high, just doubled. <laughs> it's not quite signed yet, so pray, will you? If you... Uh, Frederick Douglass was many things. Um, but one, I'm sorry, one last thought about that collection. Just one last thought. What made it so important, what makes it so important, and by the way, I was not the first to ever see it, but I was the first to use it. Now a whole variety of other Douglas scholars have gone to work on the dining room table. Um, but it opened up as never before an understanding, a pathway into the last third of Douglas's life. Um, if Americans know much about Frederick Douglass, they tend to know the young Douglass. They might have grown up reading the narrative in school now. Uh, they might know that this was the escaped slave who became such a, uh, an, a, a, an extraordinary uh, charismatic orator in his 20s, in the 1840s. They might know something about his political role in the coming of the Civil War, and they might know that he met Lincoln three times or something. But that last third of his life, the aging man, the older patriarch, uh, uh, the man who became a bureaucrat, who had three federal appointments, uh, who kind of was the old radical who became the political insider, the old outsider who became the political insider. Eh, he's just an aging man falling out of touch and not terribly interesting. Most treatments of Douglas have not said that he wasn't interesting, but have never treated the last third of his life quite as deeply and seriously as the younger heroic Douglas. The Evans Collection opens up what is so fascinating about aging. Come on, give it up for aging. Come on. Even if you're not aging, or if you don't think you are, you are. <laughs> I think that's a given. But it turns out that old radical outsider, always on the outside of power, when he gets his toehold inside the Republican Party and even a foothold inside the government with three federal appointments, that's a fascinating story. And it makes Douglas the prototype of so many others in our lifetime. Think of all the great leaders of the Civil Rights Movement who were radical outsiders and then became congressmen and senators and for God's sake, there was a community organizer in Chicago who became president of the United States. 
How did that happen? That seems like ancient history now. Do you remember that? <laughs> or it turns out a man who ends up with four surviving adult children, 21 grandchildren, at times about three fictive uh, siblings who adopted him or he adopted them, and a variety of other hangers-on because he was Douglas, and because some of them thought he had a lot of money. Turns out that's fascinating, especially when that extended family, when you can get at it, has all kinds of problems. And don't extended families have problems? Today we'd call them dysfunctional at times. They had bankruptcies, they had lawsuits, they had marital trouble. His son-in-law at one point sued him very publicly. When he gets appointed recorder of deeds in the District of Columbia, he gets eight appointments as clerks. Who are the first four? His four adult children. <laughs> All over the press, black press, white press, Douglas is a nepotist, 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 nepotist. He finally said, all right, all right. Yeah, it's nepotism. <laughs> but my kids needed jobs. Now, you couldn't get away with that today. <laughs> You're awake. <laughs> today, you just appoint them to create world peace. I better stop there. <laughs> and it turns out the aging leader who is so widely, almost universally recognized as the most important black leader in the United States, the greatest black voice, the greatest African American of letters, and so on, and so on, and so on. What happens when that happens? It happens all the time, doesn't it? The next generation wants to knock him off. And he ends up in all kinds of rivalries and bitter struggles and fights with the next generation of black, particularly male leadership. And that next generation of black leadership by the 1870s, 80s, and into the 90s are all freeborn and college educated. And here's this old Douglas who never spent one day of his life in a schoolroom Everybody thinks he's the hottest and best thing since, finish the sentence. Uh, <laughs> <buddy>. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, sure. Uh, um, he gets into bitter rivalries with John Mercer Langston, Oberlin graduate, Howard University law professor, U.S. Minister to Haiti. He gets into terrible fights with Richard T. Greener, first black graduate of Harvard, lawyer, professor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those rivalries are deeply human. And there are times when Douglas throws mud back at them worse than they throw at him. This aging man was fascinating because he was so completely human and at times flawed and hypersensitive and worried every day about what is going to happen today to my son's daughter and grandkids. And oh, and by the way, 11 of the 21 grandchildren died of all kinds of diseases between the age of 1 and 14 or 15 over a 10-year period. Half of his grandchildren, they conducted so many funerals from Cedar Hill, the house in Washington, they lost count. That's a very modern story about family. The Evans Collection opened that up as never before. All right. Douglas was many things, but I think he was the prose poet of American democracy. That's a big thing to claim. But between the moment he started delivering public speeches in 1841, and then when he wrote his first autobiography, that masterful short narrative, which is the greatest slave narrative ever written, until his second one, uh, he, and, and down to the end of his life in 1895, he wrote millions of words. 
He wrote 1,200 pages of autobiography. A first, a second, a third, Life and Times, written in 1881. And then he revises that third one yet a fourth time in 1892. And if you're a biographer of this person, never trust anybody who writes three autobiographies <laughs> because they're always trying to be in your way. And, and he is. He's always right here in your way. You're trying to see under him and over him and around him, and, but you can't quite see through him because there's so much he's not going to tell us in those autobiographies. Along the way, he wrote one novella in 1852 called The Heroic Slave. He wrote hundreds and hundreds of the short-form political editorial in his newspaper of 16 years, The North Star, which then later became Frederick Douglass's paper. He mastered that declarative voice of the political editorial as he was examining week after week after week the political crises of the 1850s. And then there, there, and then there are the speeches, thousands of them. Some of the greatest works of oratory in all of American history were written by this man. He had a few other rivals in the golden age of oratory for the greatest orator in America. There were, there were a bunch of them. You know, even Edward Everett, who spoke for how many, three hours at Gettysburg or something? Classical orators who were always waving their arms and doing this and this and throwing their heads back if they had hair anyway. Um, it, um, but here's one thing to note. Every major Douglas speech, whether it's the Fourth of July speech, the Great Freedmen's Memorial speech dedicating that monument in Lincoln Park in Washington, the Mission of the War speak, speech in the midst of the Civil War, the Lessons of the Hour speech at the end of his life about lynching, and dozens and dozens of others, they all exist in a text form. He was not the order who would just walk into Midtown Books and blow out the lights off the top of his head. I mean, he could do that. And he sometimes would obviously stray from his texts. And he could blow out some lights in a church or a hall or a whatever if, if, he, if he was up for it. But he wrote them down. And some of these features are 25 and 30 pages in text. And after the Civil War, most of them are in typescript. He was a writer, not just the sermonic orator. He was that too. And he's born in 1818, out on the eastern shore of Maryland, along a, a little horseshoe bend in the Tuckahoe River. He is nobody born nowhere. He's a slave in a backwater of the American Slave Society. That he spent nine of his 20 years as a slave in Baltimore, a city, a maritime port, has almost everything to do with why he ever got out. But he's going to live all the way to 1895. He's born before the first era of American modernity, before steamboats are on American rivers, before the telegraph, before the rail, well before the railroad, well before the rotary press, which will completely revolutionize communication and make possible this abolition movement. And then a million other patents that came out of the antebellum era for every kind of machine you could imagine. But he's going to live all the way to a second great era of modernity when they got these things called light bulbs and all kinds of stuff coming out of Thomas Edison's laboratories in New Jersey. Uh, they, got, uh, they even got that little uh, internal combustion engine already that they can stick on the front of a carriage. And the first cars, of course, were called carriages. Um, good God, they got steamboats now. By then, they can go in eight days across the Atlantic. He was fascinated with, with steam power. And they even had this thing called a phonograph. We could record a voice. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and a zillion other inventions that are making life bewildering, fascinating, magical, and modern. And you may be wondering, was this great voice of the 19th century ever, ever recorded on a phonograph? And I don't think so. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty certain he wasn't, because three, weeks, uh, three months before he died, he went to dinner at a friend's house in Washington. And when he went back home, he did what probably nobody does anymore. He wrote a thank you letter for dinner, you know? I see some of you nodding and saying, oh, no, no, I still write thank you notes. Sorry. Uh, 
But he writes this long letter. It's mostly about the fact that he'd heard a phonograph that night. Uh, this Mr. Anderson, who uh, hosted him at dinner, had played a recording of a black minister named Weirs, who Douglas knew very well. And Douglas went, and most of the letters, thank you, sir, for dinner, but the whole rest of the letters about this magical, amazing, he calls it a divine invention of the phonograph. And the letter ends with a whole paragraph of him reflecting on this idea that could the human voice actually live forever? Now, I don't think he writes that letter if he's actually been recorded. Now, why wasn't he? I don't know. But you collectors, if you ever come across a Douglas recording, <laughs> will you call me first? <laughs> I and Walter Evans have an offer for you. <laughs> he doesn't know it yet. But, we'll... <laughs> but in the middle of that life, what, what happens? <laughs> Well, the very, very violent transformation of the United States. He lives the entire epic of slavery. He was a slave. He wrote more about what it meant to be a slave than any other American, both the physical character of slavery, but especially the mental, psychic level of slavery. The coming of the Civil War, the fighting of the Civil War, America's Armageddon, uh, the emancipation of four million slaves, the transformation of the U.S. Constitution by the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, by the first Reconstruction, by the Reconstruction Acts and the first Civil Rights Act, the rise of Reconstruction, without question the most optimistic three to five years of Douglass's life, and then the fall of Reconstruction, just about as fast as it rose. And then he lives into the earliest years of the Jim Crow system. And he lives all the way into the first five or six years of the lynching crisis. And along the way, he had more to say about all of that with an eloquence unsurpassed than anyone. He's our prose poet, not just of democracy, but of our greatest problem. And it's not over. It may be why there's some kind of resonance about him today. Although I think the book just sells because of this picture. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest with you. I wanted an old Douglas. I mean, after all that, you know, diving into the aging Douglas and all, I was really into that. I wanted this 1894 Douglas. If that doesn't look like a prophet, I don't know what does. I wanted this, this old Douglas looking wry. A little bit mean, but wise. And until Simon and Schuster sent me this cover, and I said, "Okay," <laughs> as that dude just makes you look at it. <laughs> uh, anyway, with unsurpassed eloquence, he explained the nature of slavery. He expressed with terrible honesty and savage irony both the power of America's creeds and the hypocrisy with which his country contradicted and denied them. To see and to hear Douglas became a kind of wonder of the American world. Have you seen Douglas? Did you go hear Douglas? I saw Douglas at such and such, and I saw him again. It's kind of like the way people tell how many times they've been to a Springsteen concert or a whatever. And they may be lying a little, but. He was a women's rights man in an age when there weren't that many women's rights men. We can come back to that. He could be a radical thinker at times about certain issues but also an advocate of a kind of classical 19th century political liberalism, which meant a belief in politics, a belief in political institutions, and particularly a belief that the vote, above all, was the most important of all liberties and rights. He may have overemphasized the power of the vote. I hate to say that today, because it's awfully important again. At times, he both loved and hated his own country. 
sometimes at the same time. And there are a lot of stories I could tell about that, and it's a story many people have lived. He strongly believed in self-reliance, building oneself up from whatever bottom you are brought into the world in, but at the same time, he fiercely fought for an activist, interventionist government to free slaves, defeat the Confederacy, and protect black citizens against terror and discrimination. He believed in big government. At the same time, he believed in self-reliance. Why can't you do both? Because in the 19th century, a black leader had no choice. How, how could you not believe in self-reliance in the 19th century in a society that first would enslave you, uh, then it might find a way to just separate you, then it's going to find all kinds of ways to just humiliate you, and then terrorize and kill you. You're not going to be self-reliant? Today, the American right seizes on the self-reliant, Douglas, plucks quotes out of a few speeches, calls him the self-made man, and just stops there. Justice Clarence Thomas has a portrait of Frederick Douglass right behind his desk in his chambers. Douglass is his hero. I'm glad of that. Mostly. <laughs> We selectively read people, we all do this, don't we? We selectively read uh, great writers, thinkers, heroes, whatever. How many Lincolns are there? A few million? Douglas forged a hard-earned pragmatism out of political experience. He became, he, he wasn't good at being a pragmatist at first. When radicalism collides with pragmatism, are we not finding that out now with these primaries about to come? Um, when radicalism collides with pragmatism, what happens? He forged a pragmatism, though, over time because he had to, out of political experience, out of disappointment, out of despair, and sometimes out of tremendous victories. He was fundamentally, at least in my view, not a self-made man, despite the claims many make about him and claims he made about himself. One of his most famous speeches is the speech called Self-Made Men. It's one of those speeches that's a little bit like a lot of the books that we buy and keep on our shelves because we should have them on our shelves, but we never read them. No, not from this store, no. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Self-Made Men self -made Men's an incredible speech about the human spirit. It isn't just about, you know, I worked my way up from nothing and look at me. I mean, one of the most oft named and quoted people in that speech is Robert Burns, a nobody Scott who became Robert Burns. Um, Shakespeare whoever he was, who became Shakespeare. Douglas seized the King James language of the Bible and used it to deliver the most enduring critique of slavery, the coming of disunion, the Civil War, emancipation, and more delivered by any American in the 19th century. He got language in his head from the cadences of the King James. He got language in his head first from Sophia Auld, who taught him to read and write for about a year and a half, and he claims read the book of Job out loud to him. God knows what, a, what an eight-year-old understood about Job's dilemmas, but, or why the woman would even read the book of Job to him. Although it might have been the prose might have been the story of suffering. I don't know. And whatever he did and wherever he went, and it may be why he's still around for us, there was always a moral purpose to his politics.
a moral purpose to his, even when he trimmed a little, even when he found it hard to keep defending the Republican Party in the 1880s, even when he had to enforce a policy in Haiti that he came to not believe in, but he was the U.S. ambassador to Haiti, and he got himself kind of trapped, as he said, between two masters. One master was his conscience, the other master was the Secretary of State and the President. We yearn for a politics that actually has some kind of moral backbone. Amen. Well, <laughs> and last but, <clears throat> last but not least, um, he had a prophetic voice. <coughs> I'll probably just end with this, because q and A, I'm told, is very important here at Midtown Books. Um, there were many elements about writing this book that were terrible dilemmas. Uh, how to find and analyze Anna, what to do with other relationships with women, the family story, um, his ideas about certain great issues. But none was more of a problem for me for a long time in writing this book than that I wanted to use the word prophet in the title, but I was afraid of it. And let's be honest. Uh, that's a big word. You shouldn't just throw it around like popcorn. Oh, that's prophetic. That's prophetic. Oh, she said the sun would rise again tomorrow, and it did. Oh, it must be prophetic. <coughs> if you meet somebody and they say they're a prophet, they're not. You don't proclaim yourself a prophet. Not at least in the tradition that Douglas understood, the, the tradition of the Hebrew prophets, the Judeo-Christian tradition in which he learned this, a prophet is at the very least reluctant. A prophet is probably chosen, but I don't know how to completely explain or understand that, do you? And in the middle of writing this, I was just wishing I could have a year off to go read theology. I never had the year off to do, I had a year off. I was a professor in England at Cambridge for a year. And I read a lot of theology while I was there, but not systematically. I was there to write, but I checked a lot of books out. <laughs> but to make a long story short, I have some good friends who are, I have no formal theolo theological training. I took a couple undergraduate courses like, I don't know, Introduction to the New Testament, and something on the Old Testament at a public university. I was raised in a Lutheran church, but escaped it when I was about 22. But it never completely escaped me, like Garrison Keillor argued for 50 years on NPR. I won't do any Lutheran jokes, <laughs> but because I'm in Pennsylvania. But, but seriously, I have theologian friends, particularly three of them, but I, I, I relied on them. I called them up. I said, will you have lunch with me? Will you talk with me? What should I read? How do I understand how Douglas is? D There's no Douglas speech that isn't laced at some point with Isaiah or Jeremiah or Amos or Ezekiel particular, or Genesis. He employed the Noah's Ark story all sorts of ways. What do I do with that? I kept asking my theologian friends. Well, one example, at least, uh, my dear friend Don Shriver, who used to be president of Union Theological Seminary in New York, is now in his 90s, not in good health. I just talked to him yesterday. Uh, there's a uh, book of essays coming out in his honor, and he had forgotten that I already sent mine in in September, and he was bugging me. David, I don't have your essay. Yes, you do, Don. Just look at your email. Anyway, I called him up finally. Don, please help me. Don is a truly amazing man. Uh, born in, he's a, he's a white southerner, born in Virginia, educated in North Carolina, went to Davidson College, grows up in segregation. His life was totally transformed by the civil rights movement. He became an advocate of the social gospel. Um, and of course, he, took, he eventually rose to this leadership position, one of the greatest the theological seminaries in the United States. He says, come on down to New York, we'll have lunch. We had lunch at a little cafe on Broadway up by Columbia. 
And I asked him this stupid question, like, Don, what should I read on the Old Testament? <laughs> and he finished laughing in about five minutes and said, all right, you got to read this, you got to read that, you got to read this, you got to read Robert Alter, but you really got to read Walter Brueggemann. You got to read Brueggemann on the Exodus, you got to read Brueggemann on Isaiah, you got to read this and this and this and that. And he was right. I have a close friend in New Haven who is a rabbi. He used to be head rabbi at Yale, uh, Jim Ponet. He discovered my dilemma. Actually, Jim's retired, and he and his wife sit in the front row of my lecture class. She still comes every year. She's already heard it all. I don't know why she comes. <laughs> One day, Jim said, come on, let's have lunch, sit down. And from Jim, I learned that I had to read Abraham Heschel, uh, the great Jewish theologian of the mid-20th century. It was in Heschel, I, as well as many others, that I finally got my feet on this word prophet. Heschel wrote just you know, thousands of pages on what were the Hebrew prophets. Who were they? What, what are they? What is a prophet, at least in this tradition? There's just one line from Heschel. The prophet is human, said Heschel. Yet he employs notes one octave too high for our ears. He experiences moments that defy our understanding. He is neither a singing saint nor a moralizing poet, but an assaulter of our minds. Often his words begin to burn us where our conscience ends. The prophet tends to be, well, first of all, they're, they're people of words. And we wouldn't be here if it weren't for Douglas's words. Words are the only weapon and the only power he ever possessed. But they are people who can find words at times the rest of us can't to explain that tragedy, to explain that huge pivot in history, that terrible condition of humankind. Where are the prophets about climate change now? Well, they've written probably 15 books around here. Forget about history. Just read about climate change. I didn't say that. But Heschel helped me finally get my feet with what a prophet. And the more I read Heschel, the more I read uh, Robert Alton, the more I read Brueggemann, I kept having these moments. I'd read a passage. I'd say, aha, that's Douglas. Oh, yep, that's Douglas. Oh, that's Douglas. And if you read enough of Douglas, you don't even have to read very much. You're going to read sentences and paragraphs, passages that just beat you between the eyes. And you wonder, good God, how did he, where did he get that metaphor? How did, he, how did he come up with that? How did that guy write that Fourth of July speech, that masterpiece, that symphony in three movements about American hypocrisy that tortures you through the whole long middle movement of the symphony and yet lets you up a little at the end with some softer violins after you've had the drums bashing at you for 10 pages? It's like he hands you a towel at the end to dry off. <laughs> and he says, your country is still young and malleable. It may not be too late. That's a prophet. And when he could trot out the Noah's Ark story, when he needed a metaphor for rebirth, and he did it most beautifully after Lincoln's reelection in 1864, he went to a black church in Rochester, a packed house, and he started out by, he didn't, he didn't name his text, he didn't have to. He just started out by telling the story. You know the ark, he said? The ark went aground. And Noah wondered. And something happened. And Noah sends a dove out of the ark. And the dove returns with an olive branch in its beak. And Douglas says, Noah wondered, could it be? So he sends the dove out again, and it doesn't return. So Noah decides it's time. He starts taking the tarp off the ark, and lo, the world is green and reborn. That's the oldest rebirth metaphor in Western civilization. It's how Douglas began his speeches to explain the meaning of Lincoln's reelection, which to him meant now, now, likely, this war is going to be fought to the bitter end to end slavery. 
He could have just said, time for a rebirth. <laughs> That's not rhetoric. That's a statement. So what's happened to our political pros today? Everybody makes a statement instead of speaking. And I'll just stop with this. At the, in the last sentence of his long-form masterpiece, which was his second autobiography, they have it right down those stairs, right on that shelf. I think it's the, uh, it's either the Library of America edition or I forget, maybe Penguin. It's not mine, mine's by Yale Press, but that's all right. <laughs> it's quite all right. Um, but a 440 page second autobiography, which is some, by some measures, the greatest autobiography of the 19th century by an American. It's a much more political autobiography. He plants that baby in 1855 in the midst of the slavery crisis. He shoulders up to the possible uses of violence in it. He's become a very political animal in that autobiography, and he's a much more sophisticated writer. But when he had to write an ending, the last sentence, Bondage and Freedom, reads, I will never forget my humble origins, and as long as heaven allows me to do this work, I will do it with my voice, my pen, and my vote. I've always loved that because, I guess in part because he put the word vote on. My voice, my pen, my vote. Douglas never made a living any other way than with his, uh, except in New Bedford for three years when he worked with his hands. But he never earned a living any other way than with his voice and his pen. But now he said, with my vote. And what do we have? What do any of us have? Unless you have great wealth in the age of Citizens United, all you have is a voice, a pen, and a vote. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to transition to our audience Q&A portion of the evening. There's one of me. There's a lot of you. So we're going to start over here, move over here. David is upstairs. And if we have any questions on the balcony, we can pop over to him anytime. But do we have any questions starting over here? Professor, can you talk about the three days that Douglas spent here in Harrisburg? Sure. <laughs> uh, Steve, right? We met beforehand. Uh, he, <clears throat> he reminded me that I wrote this up in like three pages, beginning on page 186, so I uh, <clears throat> looked it up. Actually, the context, I'm glad you did, because the context is, is 1847. He's uh, just come back from England in the spring of 1847. Uh, later that summer, he starts a tour Actually, it would, and it would be the last tour he will ever do with William Lloyd Garrison, his mentor, the man who sort of discovered him, uh, under whose tutelage he learned his abolitionism, et cetera, et cetera, but with whom he's already having difficulty, an urging for independence, a struggle over um, Garrison's incredibly strict principles and strategies like disunionism, which Garrison made one of the themes of that tour they were doing together. And by that, Garrison meant have no complicity with a slave-owning government. Now, Garrison was the real thing. We have to stop a moment and admit, Garrison was a radical abolitionist. And he inspired people, black and white. He had a lot of black followers. Make no mistake. If you met William Lloyd Garrison, you were meeting the real thing, a professional radical abolitionist. Now, whether you could follow all of his sometimes anarchistic tenets was another matter. It's on this tour that the break between Garrison and Douglas really begins to take shape. But they started the tour in Philadelphia at Bethel AME, famous black church in Philly, to an incredibly rousing, celebratory audience and Douglas wax it's in the book he waxed on about what a what a joyous event they had at 
at Bethel AME. The, the, that was the founding church of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. But when they got out here to uh, Harrisburg, uh, they got roughed up, to be honest. Uh, you can read this on pages 186, 187, and so forth. But here in Harrisburg, they got attacked by a mob. Now, that, that has actually much less to do with Harrisburg than it did with 150 other towns all across the north. This tour is going to go on from here, but it almost ended here. They had eggs hurled at them, stones hurled at them, brickbats, which was always an all-purpose word for stones, bricks, or other flying objects. Um, they were speaking in a... Oh, I don't know, maybe it's in a footnote. I can't remember what building it was, and I always risk this if I'm in some city. The courthouse? Okay, thank you, thank you. If I don't name the right place, I'll be in trouble. And, you know, the, the refrain of the mob is, throw out the N-word, throw out the N-word, and then there's some, kill the N-word, kill the N-word. Um, a, a stone grazed his face and scarred his face, he said. And then he, he apparently locked arms with a small group of black men who kind of came in to get him, and they just went out through the crowd. Uh, he had no you know, security detail. There was no such thing in the 19th century. Um, the next night, Douglas went to a small AME church, a black church, here in Harrisburg. And there, he said, a more interesting array of faces I have seldom looked upon. He probably felt safe. Um, and he particularly marveled at how the women were in control of the place. Surprise. <laughs> he referred then to the brutal insults and outrages they had experienced uh, the day before. They went on from here out to Pittsburgh and then out into Ohio, and it became, like so many of these abolitionist tours, like a traveling salvation show. It's the last tour he'd ever do with Garrison, and you have to try to imagine this, and I hope this gets into the movie if it gets made. There's a film in the, in the works, but because they used what was called, by the time they got to Ohio, they didn't use it here, by the time they got to Ohio on that tour, they were using what was called the Oberlin Tent. It was a huge tent that had been made in Oberlin, which was an abolitionist town with an abolitionist college. And that tent, they said, could hold 3,000 people. Maybe. They could put that baby up and tear that baby down, put it in the back of a wagon and take it to the next town. Usually they pitched it out in a farmer's field. And what happened on this particular tour is what happened on many of these tours. Uh, they had a little platform they'd put up in the front of the tent, but none of these. No microphones. Douglas and Garrison started to lose their voices. And I have press accounts that say that. Eventually, Garrison got deathly sick and had to be taken up to Cleveland, uh, where he, he nearly did die. He had a, like a terrible pneumonia. I don't know what else he had. And that's when the breakup with Douglas really started because Garrison seems to have never forgiven Douglas for not coming to his bedside in Cleveland to visit him. Well, Douglas was still out on the tour trying with his hoarse voice to keep it moving. But they got really roughed up in Harrisburg. But that happened lots of places. And actually, sometimes it was what they aimed for in the 1840s at least. Maybe not at that point, by the late 40s, but early in the 40s, if an audience didn't get riled up, you probably hadn't done your job. That's really the way they viewed it. Question to your left? Yes. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if you can talk about his second marriage, and I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested how, I, I've always thought that the fact that that he um, got married to a white woman mm -hmm. it, during the ascendancy of Lintua was the like, most revealing fact that you could say about his life. But then I know your, your, um, your research mm -hmm. complicates that. So I'm, I'm curious what your 
assessment of that mm -hmm. event is for what it says about. Yeah. How did I complicate? I'm just curious. I mean, maybe well, because I there, there was so much controversy. You it was what? Uh, sorry. Because there's so much controversy yeah. that you well, uncovered, but the. But it still happened. Yeah, I guess I'm yeah. just curious what you sure. thought about this. Sure. Scenario. Well, first of all, one entire scrapbook out of the nine in the Evans collection is devoted to the marriage to Helen Pitts because the press accounts of that went on and on and on for months on end, and the sons just kept clipping them and putting them in the book. Um, first of all, very briefly, let's remember Anna, his first wife of 44 years. Um, the pillar of his house, as he called her when she died. She died in 1882 after a, a variety of illnesses for quite some time. She had a series of strokes. Uh, she died at Cedar Hill in the summer of 1882. Douglas had probably a pretty serious emotional breakdown when that happened. It's very hard to prove such a thing historically but he wandered off by himself to Maine for two months. He went to Poland Springs, Maine. You know where the water bottles come from? The water's probably out of the Boston taps, but it's, it, you know, <laughs> Poland Springs. They had a resort in Poland Springs. And there, there's just enough correspondence where I couldn't figure out. He may have stayed in a farmhouse, you know, just rented a room, or he may have stayed at the resort, I don't know. But he did write some, at least a handful of priceless letters to his daughter while he was up there. But he was just by himself in the wake of Anna's passing. Her funeral was an extraordinarily public event for this most unpublic woman. Whoa. Anna didn't do public. But when she died, Black leaders around Washington, D.C. all elbowed each other out of the way to be pallbearers at Douglas's wife's funeral. And then the day after, went back to attacking him. <laughs> but about 15 months later, he married Helen Pitts. Helen Pitts was 20 years younger, a white woman, a very well-educated Mount Holyoke graduate. She grew up in an abolitionist family in western New York, out south of Buffalo. Um, during the Civil War, she worked as a young nurse missionary in a slave refugee camp in Washington, D.C., where she caught malaria and had to go home. It wouldn't let her go back. Uh, he had actually met her when she was like an early teenager while visiting Western New York. They both remembered that. Uh, and he hired her in um, somewhere around 1883 or 4, uh, as one of the eight clerks in the Recorder of Deeds office. Four of them are the four dull children. <laughs> Helen sat in a desk immediately next to Rosetta, Douglas's oldest child, uh, his daughter, and Helen and Rosetta were almost the same age, maybe a year apart. One day, Rosetta was sitting at her desk, uh, I don't know, four in the afternoon probably, and a reporter comes in and says, do you realize your father just bought a marriage license down the hall here today? Because it was in City Hall. And I don't know exactly what Rosetta's response was, but it must have been something like, what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> because they kept it totally secret from his own children, from anyone else and clearly from her family. She will pay for this. Her father disowned her. Her mother finally owned up to it, uh, and a sister owned up to it. Uh, Douglas's children never really did. Now, by all accounts, however, and we could talk more if you want about how scandalous this marriage was. This is the most famous black man in the world, marries a white woman 20 years younger. I mean, that'd be pretty big news today. I mean, although hopefully we wouldn't go nuts over it like they did then. But by all accounts, for the next 11 years, the rest of Douglas's life, this was a, a, a really, really good marriage. Uh, it's hard to find any example otherwise. They read all kinds of things together. They traveled. She became a public wife. She traveled with him. 
uh, there were a lot of troubles uh, to begin with. Uh, Helen moved into Cedar Hill, became the woman of the house, and immediately they had a couple of servants or workers, one of whom was the sister of Rosetta's husband. Okay, Rosetta's the daughter. Her husband's name was Nathan Sprague. Nathan, Nathan was what my mother would have called a ne'er-do-well. Um, uh, he'd had all kinds of trouble in his life keeping jobs. He was a former fugitive slave, a black soldier in the Civil War, a very young kid when Rosetta meets him, very handsome. There's a photo of him in the book. I mean, the kid was dashing, but a mess. And Rosetta had six babies with him in 13 years. Um, Helen moves in and fired the sister of Nathan's who had been working there for quite a while. And Nathan sues his father-in-law for back pay. That's the lawsuit that happens. Anyway, um, so the marriage, though, was a huge scandal in the black press and in the white press. He had, they had many defenders, without a question, but probably most people, uh, by, by and large, most people condemned them. Uh, and the press is just full of this sort of thing. And by the way, the craziest thing that happens, the funniest thing that happens, is that, is that more and more of the press keep covering this marriage. He gets older and she gets younger. <laughs> I mean, about six months out, Helen was like 32. She was really 46. And Douglas was like 78. I mean, it was ridiculous what people were writing about this. Uh, he's marrying his granddaughter, and so on, so on. He was 66, she was 46. Um, there were people who made good friends with them and others who couldn't, and so on. Ida Wells, the famous Ida Wells, the young woman who's coming on the scene as the great reformer against lynching, and whom Douglas took under his wing, and who at times kind of stuck it to Mr. D when she thought he wasn't thinking right although they had a very strong relationship, she also developed a very strong friendship with Helen. So there's a lot of drama both ways in that. Uh, I don't know, we could go on and on about that. Question the fourth row. We need to move into the middle, yes sir. Yeah, I'd ask you to uh, talk a little bit about his uh, religious upbringing. Did he have any religious upbringing? Did he have any um, mm -hmm. formal religious training? Yeah. And what was his level of education uh, generally? Well, first of all, his level of education has nothing to do with formal schooling. It has to do with mentors, sort of a teacher here and there, and simply reading. I got access to his book collection at the National Park Service has a warehouse uh, out in Landover, Maryland, huge warehouse where they keep all their treasures. And then those accordion bookshelves that move back and forth when you push buttons, uh, they have Douglas's three or 4,000 book collection that he had at the end of his life. Um, you can learn a lot from that, but you can't always know exactly what he's read. But he did own three complete works of Shakespeare, complete works of Robert Burns, complete works of Dickens, complete works of this and this and this and this and that, and lots of guidebooks to the Bible. That I was looking for, and that was a find. He owned no less than two uh, guides to the book of Isaiah. I don't know exactly how he used them. But I checked those out of the library at Yale uh, and tried to figure out how he was using them, but pretty elusive. Okay, he comes by religion as a child and as a young teen when he's a slave. And he tells us quite explicitly in the narrative and in the second autobiography that early on he was a Christian believer. He believed in a God who was a deliverer. A Christ who was a deliverer, who had the fate of a, of a suffering slave like him, hopefully, he, he thought, in his, in his uh, hands, uh, although he could not be sure. He is raised around Methodist. Now, he hated religious hypocrisy, and that was one of his favorite topics. But, you know, he still grew up around Methodists, Protestants. And if you read the narrative, you'll see the I mean, one of the most 
for unforgettable sections is his memory of being taken to a camp meeting. A big, and the Eastern Shore had lots of revival camp meetings. They had a whole big place out along one of the rivers that was always the camp meeting place for the traveling Methodist. And Thomas Auld took him there. For the better part of a week, the slaves all had to stay over there in tents, and their masters stayed over here. The slaves never got inside the circle of confession. They always had to stand around the outside, and Douglas remembers getting close enough to watch his weeping master, watch Thomas Auld on his knees, making his confession to Christ and crying his eyes out. And now, when Douglas writes about that, 20 years later, or no, 15 years later in the narrative, he, of course, is shaping it and using it for all it's worth to demonstrate a hypocrisy. And he tells us, you know, the next week back in uh, St. Michael's that Thomas Alt took a whip to him. Uh, although Alt only rarely beat him. <laughs> um, now, I'll just say this. Douglas's faith changes over time. I don't think there's any question about that in terms of his personal belief, but that's less my concern in this book than it is with the ways he uses biblical storytelling, the way he uses biblical metaphor, the way he uses the language of the King James, the way he uses the uh, temperament of the Hebrew prophets, the way he is a Jeremiah in his own right, issuing the warnings, the warnings, the warnings to this people who claim this but do that, uh, whose temple is, is going to be destroyed, just like the temple in Jerusalem had to be destroyed. I also am less concerned about his, f I mean, I, it's not that I don't care about it. I do care. I wish he had stopped at some point and written down, you know, at three points in his life, a three-page statement of his, of his sense of a creed. But he didn't do that. Here is what I believe at age 25, age 45, and age 75. He didn't do that. Uh, later in his life, there's some evidence that he might have been personally uh, rather an agnostic by then, but he still couldn't deliver a speech without biblical language. And that's not surprising. Neither could Lincoln. Uh, neither could so many Americans. The Bible was so much the template for understanding history, understanding morality, understanding human, the human condition. Um, now, he had a relationship with one Otelia Ossing. If you've read the book, you know about her. A German woman, long story. Uh, a relationship of approximately 22 years, on and off, on and off, probably sexual, can't be proven. One Douglas scholar says it wasn't, some of us say it was, but many would probably say, who cares? Um, Ossing was a ferocious atheist, and she did get him to read Feuerbach, uh, the famous German atheist agnostic, and he did read Feuerbach. He owned Feuerbach. He even had a bust of Feuerbach that Ossing gave him. Ossing claimed she had converted him to atheism, which is essentially nonsense. She claimed a lot about Douglas. Um, so, very hard to know. But, last thought, that Protestantism he's raised in, sometimes his anti-Catholicism would flow out of him when he didn't expect it. And one great example I'll give you is when he and Helen go to Europe on an 11-month tour, 1886-87. They went all over Western Europe, and they went all over the Mediterranean, including Egypt and Greece. Douglas is awed by the great cathedrals of Europe. In Britain, then in Paris, then in southern France, then in Italy. He goes nuts in Rome. Who wouldn't? But he can't do it without saying, how can humankind create such fantastic edifices and still believe in popery and priesthood? <laughs> <laughs>
and he bashes Catholicism as in his diary. That's in private, although it did come out sometimes in public. And by the way, he was a lifetime, um, he, was, he was obsessed in some ways with the Epistle Paul. He was fascinated with Paul, Paul's writings. And, it, and he often called him the prisoner apostle, which he was called often. And it may, that may have been why he identified with him, because he was, you know, captured, jailed, imprisoned by the Romans, and ultimately killed by the Romans. I, I, but on that tour of Europe and across the Mediterranean, like six, seven times in the diary, I mean, my God, they get to Naples, Naples, one of maybe one of the most beautiful places on earth. And he's, again, he's awed by this church and the bay and so on. But he says, all I really want to see is that dock south of Naples where Paul came ashore. Oh, Fred, I mean, come on. You're in Naples, for God's sake. <laughs> then they're crossing the Mediterranean, and he sees the lanterns and lights on Cyprus going toward uh, Egypt. And he writes into his diary, I wonder if Paul saw, the, saw those lights going the opposite direction in the chains of the Romans. And then when they get to Athens, I mean, he's in Athens, and he goes to the Acropolis. What does he really want to see? What's that? that oh, it's in the book. I have a photo of it. Ario, uh, that, 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 uh, area, area what? Area, it's in the, that's it. Area Acropolis, Acropolis. It's a big hill. Yes, where Paul spoke to, to the Greek Stoics. Douglas tells us he went out there, read that passage in the Bible on his last day in Athens. I mean, my God. This is, this is a fascination with Paul that is, is, is just not hard and not easy to explain, but I, I made the most of those diary passages. And even when he got back into Italy on the way back then into Europe and then back home, he says at one point, all I want to see is that area of the Appian Way where Paul was dragged in chains. So... There's a, there's, a, there's a deep, there's a really good essay to be written on Douglas's fascination with Paul by, by a biblical scholar uh, who's better than me. And by the way, I'm still waiting. It's 16 months out now. I'm still waiting for a theologian to do a review of my book and just take me to pieces. But it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> I've gotten away with it. <sighs> so far. <laughs> so, uh, who's next? So we are running out of time, but we have time for three more questions here. Three more, okay. This man's been waving over here a lot, oh. so, and then the lady, the lady in the front row, too. Yes, I got one. All right. Um, I'm a history teacher, and... All right. Um, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. <laughs> I was just wondering... I am, too. Like, oh, something. yes. Um, so, I've always been drawn to the social history of African Americans because those are my people, and I was wondering what your experience was that drew you to Frederick Douglass. Was it an experience, a class, a book that you read? Like, what made you want to study mm -hmm. him your whole life versus, like, Abraham Lincoln or somebody else? Oh, we don't need another book on Lincoln. <laughs> uh, although they keep flowing. Uh, uh, well, the first real reason, ma'am, is that he is just so important. However, it has a lot to do with when I grew up and came of age. I, I took the first ever black history course taught at Michigan State in either 1968 or 69. It was taught by a man named Les Rout. Les was a Brazilianist by profession. He was, he was African American. Uh, but he wrote, he wrote books on uh, like Juan Perón and the coffee industry. That was his field. But probably the department in 1969 said, Les, you're black. You're teaching this. And it was a great course, at least in my memory. All brand new to me. I didn't learn any of this in high school, although I had two terrific high school history teachers, one for you know, Western Civ and one for U.S. Then I was a high school teacher for seven years in my hometown of Flint, Michigan, in the 70s. And we were creating something called Black History Courses. Uh, that doesn't mean we knew what we were doing. But I remember getting, uh, and these were prosperous times in good old Flint. Not only was the water good, but so was, <laughs> so was employment levels. And 
I taught in a brand new high school that had just been opened. Always a good sign for a city if you're opening schools. But anyway, I got the school librarian to buy, I don't know, whatever it was, 200 copies of John Hope Franklin's From Slavery to Freedom. Sixth edition or seventh or whatever it was at that point. Uh, I got him to buy uh, Kenneth Stamps, The Peculiar Institution, which was the only book I knew on slavery at that point. Um, and then when I went off to graduate, oh, and by the way, when I was a high school teacher, I don't know, you, you, you're a teacher, you know. You just, you gotta do whatever it is to turn kids on. You gotta do cartwheels, you gotta sing, you gotta dance, you gotta, but you gotta teach too. And I used to have posters all over the place, but I had, I had a poster of Douglas put out by, I don't know, Scholastic or whatever that company is. Big, huge poster. And I've saved it. I have it framed. It's up in my apartment at home to this day because it has his wrong birth date on it. <laughs> and it has a middle initial of E. He had no middle initial. It's a, it's a keepsake because it's like having a, you know, a Willie Mays baseball card with the wrong statistics or something. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's keepsake. Um, but then when I went to grad school, I, look, uh, I wanted to study abolitionism, coming of the Civil War, and I particularly wanted to study black abolitionists because they hadn't been done that much. And it isn't much more complicated than that. Uh, and as I said earlier, I tried to get Douglas out of my life, and he, he wouldn't let me. It's his fault. But I'll say uh, one last serious thing. I think anybody who studies Douglas is, has to say this. I've just been always attracted to his words. Uh, th this, was a, this was a genius with language. And um, I have always just found that irresistible. I can read the same speech by Douglas for the 14th time. I just see new things. I've even taken to getting clean copies. Anyway, I underline everything I do. But I've even gotten clean copies of certain of them just to read it anew because it's a new experience. He's that kind of writer. He should be studied because he is like studying Shakespeare. He is like studying Emerson. We've got a question on the art history floor. Right over here. Um, to your right. Up here. Yes. Okay. Right up here. There you are. There you are. Up here. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I have a question about the Walter Evans collection. Sure. You talked so magnificently about it at the beginning. When you looked at that collection, and I assume there's so much of it, were there certain pieces of it that get, that kind of jumped out at you or answered some questions? You've done so much research on him, but did the collection kind of connect some dots for you or answer some questions, you know, maybe some areas you hadn't covered or hadn't discovered? Well, yes, on the macro level, it's this whole last third of Douglas's life, which came into focus over and over and over and over again. Uh, because I'm able to, for example, he moves, he moves to Washington, D.C. in 1872 when his house was burned in Rochester, probably by arson. And his entire extended family, which are now adult children with, with their own children growing up, they all moved to Washington. <laughs> and they all get involved in this and that and this and that and this and that. But because of his uh, fame and prominence, his extended family, I learned from the Evans collection, from, all, from these clippings, because there were like nine Washington, D.C. newspapers, eight or nine in these years. Three of them were black newspapers, black owned. The rest, you know, white, mainstream, whatever. But his extended, he and his extended family became what I, in the book I called the black first family. Everything they do gets into the press. If there's a bankruptcy, it's in the press. If there's a lawsuit, it's in the press. Uh, if his two sons create a baseball team, which they did, it's in the press. And I had originally written about five pages on that in the book, and my editor said, nya, 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 nya. Uh, you can't, don't get carried away. And he's a big baseball fan, but, but he's, now you're getting carried away here with this baseball thing. And I said, well, so what? You know. <laughs> uh, but that's in the press. I mean, you know, um, 
so I was able to see into the, the nature of their lives in Washington, D.C. Doesn't mean I explain it all, because sometimes you can't get to it. Uh, anecdotes, down to the micro level, anecdotes. What, as a biographer, what you dream of are pieces of texture, anecdotes that become your nodes, or as William James put it, they're the perches the bird stops on in its flight. The bird is our narrative. The perches are the facts, the little stories on which the bird lands. Anyway, um, all kinds of anecdotes I get out of the Evans collection about family life, about his public life. And I get reactions. When he's out speaking, and, and we didn't necessarily stress this, but Douglas may have been heard by, I mean, I say this in the book, I can't prove it, but he may have been, it may have been that more people heard Douglas speak than any other American of the 19th century because of the sheer ubiquity of his lecture travel. The only one who might compare would be Mark Twain. Uh, Twain probably traveled more miles, but that's in part because he went to Asia. That's cheating. Um, and I get all, there are all kinds of these short, oh, by the way, the family hired a clipping service. In the middle, uh, early, mid-1880s, they hired a clipping service called the American Bureau, which I didn't even know existed. And so many of these clippings have at the top a stamp. This is American Bureau, American Bureau, American Bureau. Who knew there was a clipping service? I don't know what it cost. I never could find a receipt. But I get all these anecdotes. He's speaking in Kokomo, Indiana at an ice rink in the summer. It wasn't. But I get all these anecdotes about where he loses his voice and doesn't lose his voice. I get interviews that are conducted in local papers. I'll give you one quick example. This is the stuff of biography. He's in Iowa City, Iowa, since we got Iowa on the brain. Uh, he's on a lecture tour. It's 1869. And he's trying out a new speech, which he shouldn't have. He, at one point here, he decided for this lecture season, and by the way, he'd go on the road for like three and four months at a time and speak on the average of at least every other night. I mean, and when anybody starts complaining about their touring around, they shouldn't complain. Um, he tried out a new speech called William the Silent. He had decided he had to get, he had to show his chops as a historian, especially a historian of Europe, uh, because he was getting tired of talking about himself. And he said that. I get tired of saying the same things. And uh, he wrote, he did a bunch of research and he read all about William of Orange, the Dutch king who helped move the Netherlands toward a republic. And it is quite a story, but Americans didn't give a damn about it. <laughs> they never heard of William the Silent. And there's Douglas with his 25-page text, and he's reading this lecture on William the Silent and republicanism in Holland. And it was just, it was failing for him. Anyway, he's in a train station in Iowa City looking dour and tired out as hell, and a reporter comes up to him and says, Mr. Douglas, uh, I hate to say this, but you didn't seem to quite have your old fire last night. Uh, and Douglas didn't say I shouldn't be giving this speech on William the Silent. He said, well, you know, if I really belt it out like I used to, I now have false teeth and it fly out. <laughs> But even better, the reporter then says, Mr. Douglas, what's the hardest part about being out here on the road, day in, day out, night in, night out, giving all these lectures? And Douglas's answer was, having to talk to people like you. <laughs> it's, it's a, and I, I got a whole paragraph out of that. you know. I mean, <laughs> but it's that kind of texture that gets you in. That's what the Evans Collection allowed. So there are, there are big issues I learned a lot about because of the, of the coverage of it, like his views on the Kansas exodus or his, his views on, on the Republican Party. Oh, God, he gets into all kinds of fights about whether to stay loyal to the Republican Party. <laughs>
And I got more clippings on that than I know what to do with. But on this micro level is, is where the, the texture of, those, of that collection was so important, was so important. Yes, sir. Uh, well, David, back here, just two more questions. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to get over here. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, <clears throat> sorry, brace yourself because my accent is not always understood. Okay. My question is, and it's nothing to do with uh, what you told us, but something about slavery. Yeah. When I was a kid about 50 years ago in France, I read a book about slavery in North Africa and West Africa. And the main thing of a book, they said that a lot of the people who were taken away were taken away because they were sold by some tribe. So they, fight, they, they were at fight all the time, and the one who lost was sold. But I've been living 25 years in this country. I never found anything about it. Well, we could give you a reading list of five, 10, 15, 20 books if you'd like. Um, there are many, many works on this. The nature of the slave trade within Africa and then across the Atlantic. <laughs> but to generalize, the European incursion into West Africa began in the late 15th century, the 1460s, 1440s, 50s, 60s, 70s before Columbus sailed for the Americas. Uh, it was first by the Portuguese, then every European empire got into the scramble for African slaves. Eventually, though, it became a gigantic, colossal, international, commercial transaction between societies somewhat stronger in technology, meaning the European empires, who had mastered navigation of the oceans, well, mastered would maybe overstated, and had firearms, uh, and African societies, ancient African societies, who were rich in um, natural resources, all kinds of natural resources. Um, but the one resource, after about 50 years and certainly the first century of this connection between Europeans and Africans, the one major resource from Africa that the Europeans wanted was people. Now, it's also a fact, which may be what you're referring to, that Africans had been engaging in slave trading amongst themselves long before they ever met Europeans long before. There'd been a trans-Saharan slave trade into the Muslim world from West Africa and even parts of Central Africa well before the Europeans ever arrived. The great kingdom of Dahomey grew out of, which, um, which covered actually several countries of West Africa and even the Bight of Benin, um, developed because of the slave trade, moving closer and closer and closer to the coast. It became a kind of a four-century business of extracting labor from Africa for the plantations and the labor of the Americas. Uh, yes, African societies were deeply complicit in the system. But also, the Europeans exploited this system for all it was worth uh, for almost four centuries and built it into the largest forced migration of human beings in all of history. Uh, the only thing we can even compare it to are, are the displacement of peoples in World War II. Um, uh, that's, that's a vast history uh, in a tiny attempt to explain it in three minutes. But uh, I could suggest a couple of books for you if, if you want. They're probably in this room or we'll down go, there. We'll go third row and then we'll end over here. Okay, good. Third row. Early on. We, we might get one quick one from you too. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, we're, um, we're aware of you know, the brutality uh, that you know, he faced, but did he ever compare himself uh, with any other writings such as uh, 
William Grimes? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know that he ever mentioned Grimes. As a matter of fact, he may not have known about no, he may not have known about Grimes. Okay, Gr William Grimes is the author of the first slave narrative ever written by an, uh, an American-born slave who escapes. He was born in Virginia. He was sold five times. He was sold finally down to Savannah, Georgia, and eventually escaped by ship to New York City and then walked to New Haven, Connecticut, which today is where he's born, uh, where he's buried <laughs> in Grove Street Cemetery. Uh, Grimes' narrative was published in 1822. It's very early. It's a stunning piece of work because he was writing before there were any conventions to this genre called slave narrative. He didn't know there was supposed to be a genre because there wasn't any. Uh, he's not writing for, uh, you know, the abolitionist audience yet because he didn't know what that is. And he self-published it. He didn't have any abolitionist society behind him like Douglas did later. And so did many other former fugitive slaves. I'm not aware that Douglas ever mentions Grimes. He may not have even known about it because it, 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 there aren't very many copies published. There's, it's now back in print. Uh, Norton, I think, has an edition of it out introduced by uh, Bill Andrews. Um, did he compare himself to other writers? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Particularly, well, compare himself is not maybe the way to put it. He saw himself in other writers. He loved Dickens. He's always quoting from Dickens. Everybody in the 19th century read Dickens. He was nuts over the English Romantic poets, especially Robert Burns. He did a pilgrimage to Ayr in Scotland when he was in Scotland the first time and met uh, Burns's daughter. He just loved that Romantic poetry. Whether we like it or not, he did. <laughs> uh, and then Shakespeare. Uh, probably his two favorite plays, just in how often he uses them, are Hamlet and Othello. Certainly Othello for reasons we can see. Hamlet for, and, and particularly the tragedies by Shakespeare. Um, he doesn't seem to have quoted the comedies much. It's like, he didn't need those. <laughs> um, uh, to the other slave narrators, no, he doesn't compare himself that much because, you know, they're competitors. He should have. I mean, he didn't have to worry. The narrative sold 30,000 copies in the first five years. That's, that's good today. Right, Mr. Bookstore owner? I mean, that's... <laughs> and Bondage and Freedom in 1855, all 440 pages of it, 18,000 copies in the first two years out. Man, that's good. You know what he did with bondage? He went on the road with it. And he took his oldest son, Lewis, who sold it to the audience. Our man was a marketer. And the 4th of July speech, masterpiece of rhetoric, he had that baby printed up. Took it on the road. You could buy it for, was it a 50 cents for one copy? But in his newspaper, he ran ads for it. You could get... Uh, a hundred copies for, I forget what it was, $8 or I don't know, was it 50 copies for 10 I can't remember what it was. You could get it by bulk, you could get it individually. He, he had, well, that's how he made a living, you know. Um, so we were gonna go. Question to your right, yep. Here? Over here, then we'll okay. go there. Okay, yes, sir, or ma'am, sir. Yes, sorry, go. You had a reason for the wonderful 1862 quote that begins your story, your, your book. There is a prophet within us forever whispering that behind the scene lies the immeasurable unseen. What did he mean by the immeasurable unseen? Oh, I wish I knew. <laughs> yes, that's the epigraph on the book. Uh, I can tell you where it comes from. There is a prophet within us forever whispering that behind the scene is the immeasurable unseen. I don't know what he, I mean, he didn't tell us after that what he meant. That comes out of one of his three essays on photography. He, he was really a pretty astute observer and analyst of this new 
modern technology, this fantastic new technology of photography. And as many of you may know now, it is believed by some that he may have been the most photographed American of the 19th century. 162 extant photographs of Douglas, actually 164 now. I found a new one at the New York Historical Society. But there's a book out that's probably available right here uh, called Picturing Frederick Douglass, uh, compiled by three terrific editors, John Stauffer, Zoe Trod, and Celeste Bernier, all friends of mine. They went all over the country and Britain to locate every extant photo of him. But they also publish in that book his three essays on photography. Now, those essays on photography are, are really less about photography, per se, than they are just philosophical about the human condition and how we react to things in technology. What did he mean by that? I don't know. Read it and decide for yourself. But maybe he meant <sighs> there could be a profit in this. Or there could be. Um, but it's behind the scene. And most of us probably never see it. Because we don't do what a prophet is always asking us to do, which is to see what we deny, to look beyond what we can see, to face what we don't want to face. That's what prophets are for. They're there to remind us and warn us and bash us, shatter us, as Herschel said, Heschel said, about the things we don't want to have to think about. Prophets are not fun to have lunch with. <laughs> Because they're probably going to be didactic and preach at you. And all you wanted to do is have a turkey sandwich. <laughs> but when I found that quote, it's trickery, isn't it? I said, God, i got to use that. Where am I going to use it? I'll put it at the front of the book. <laughs> and somebody someday may ask, Whoa, what does that mean? <laughs> but this is proof that I haven't worked up a good answer. Final question. Over All here. right, yes. I'd like to know about his split with the feminist um, All right, people good. in Seneca Falls. Terrific. Well, he didn't split with them at Seneca Falls. He split with them later, right. Douglas is at Seneca Falls, as you know, the only male speaker at Seneca Falls, although there were 22 male signers of the Declaration of Sentiments. Uh, he, he didn't go kicking and screaming to Seneca Falls. He went very willingly totally embraced the women's suffrage movement. He, he was a women's rights man, not just about the right to vote. He, he, he advocated for women's economic rights, their right, their right to property and divorce, and other economic liberties and rights that women had to give away if they got married. New York State in the 1850s kept having a bill that get, got voted on and voted on and voted on that never quite got passed. The breakup, though, that you're referring to comes with Elizabeth Cady, and he made very, very enduring friendships with Susan Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucy Stone, and many others. Did not just at Seneca Falls, but out on the circuit. In fact, he toured with women abolitionists all the time, although there were strains, partly because this guy was so good and so charismatic and not always easy, you know, to, f to follow him. <laughs> Who would want to follow him on a stage? I mean, but in 1869, the passage of the 15th Amendment, Stanton, Anthony, and others, and although not all the women suffragists, had decided they'd had it. No more patience, no more waiting. Uh, these were professional reformers, too. Uh, who might have had six children, but had devoted their lives to this cause. But uh, everyone with one eye open at all knew that if you put women's suffrage into the 15th Amendment, it never passes. Uh, there would have been no 15th Amendment. Uh, it put black male suffrage into the Constitution. And it put the word male in, as did the 14th Amendment. Uh, Stan and Anthony and others said, you know what, we're not waiting any longer. This is ridiculous. We, we postponed our movement for emancipation to transform this country. The trouble was, of course, and you, you probably already know this, 
they pushed back and fought back with some ugly racist language. Uh, it's in the book, or at least some of it. Um, they use the N-word. They use it on Douglas. They use lines like, uh, if, uh, if an ignorant black man can you know, stumble to the polls and vote, why can't a sophisticated, educated white lady, white lady like us? Uh, which to some people might have sounded reasonable. Um, Douglas took, and this was, this was an ugly breakup among, you know, the worst breakups are among dear friends or marriages. And this was an ugly breakup and they never really made up. Even though Susan Anthony will be on the same stage with him in Washington DC on the day he died. Um, he didn't even speak that day. They just wanted, this often happened. They just wanted him to be there. They just wanted him to sit there with his white man of hair and be Douglas. Uh, he went home that day about five and at six he collapsed with a heart attack and Susan Anthony went to pieces. I mean, these are lifetime radical reformers with scars all over their psyches. Um, and by the way, in the crisis of 1869 over suffrage, Douglas didn't always shine either. He said some things publicly like, but women must remember they have their husbands to vote their interest. <laughs> Ouch. Right when you thought he was so modern. <laughs> Oh, Fred, <laughs> come on, man, you know, uh, so there's a lot been written on this and uh, there, there's some great works on Stanton and Anthony now. Um, and there are some biographers of Stanton and Anthony that have really faced this question straight on. And uh, Stanton and Anthony don't don't come out of this looking too good. And by the way, too well. But by the way, if you ever get to Rochester, a lot of terrible th uh, things in history get all smoothed over, don't they, when we build little monuments about them. You ever been to Susan Anthony's house in Rochester and right across the street in the park? There's the monument to tea, having tea. It's Douglas and Susan Anthony sitting at a table having tea. <laughs> That's all you need to know. <laughs> they just went out in the park and had tea, and everything was fine. It's two amazing lives who had an ugly fight. And, uh, and of course, women didn't get the federal vote until 1919. Uh, San and Anthony were long dead. Thank you very much for coming out, everybody.